Welcome everyone to the uh, this month's ERCC webinar. I'm Roger Alexander, the Scientific Outreach Coordinator for the Extracellular RNA Communication Consortium. Um, and this month we have uh, Peter Mestach from the Onco RNA Lab at the University of Ghent and the Cancer Research Institute of Ghent. He has developed the um, Human Biofluid RNA Atlas. Um, and we're very much looking forward to hearing the details about that. It's sort of complementary to the ERCC's XRNA Atlas. Um, uh, Dr. Mestach will also be speaking at our workshop that's coming up in a few weeks. If you go to xrna.org slash workshop, um, you can read all about that. It's an, a workshop on XRNA data analysis. Um, so please check that out. Um, Everybody, please stay muted. You can ask questions in chat, and we should have plenty of time at the end of the talk for me to go over chat questions, and then probably time also for people to unmute themselves and ask questions live. So, Dr. Mestach, it's, we're really looking forward to hearing about your work. Thank you, Roger. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining. Um, so, as mentioned, I will be uh, introducing the work that we've been doing with respect to um, charting extracellular transcriptomes in various human biofluids. Um, before I, um, oops, I'm sorry. Before I, uh, I, I uh, show you uh, the data and what we've done, I just want to acknowledge this person here, Eva Hilstadt, who's a doctoral fellow in my lab, who actually. Uh, perform most of the work I will be presenting today. So there's various reasons why uh, I think many of us uh, are interested in studying uh, liquid biopsies or exploring liquid biopsies. Um, the most important one being uh, the minimally invasive nature of a liquid biopsy and associated to that the opportunity or the possibility to use uh, liquid biopsies for serial sampling um, to, for instance, follow the, the development of a certain disease, uh, to follow response of a patient to a certain therapy. Um, and um, I think that the hypothesis that, that we kind of have is that uh, nucleic acids in liquid biopsies can reflect some of those processes, uh, some of the behavior uh, that we are interested in. And um, we're really looking for signals um, that reflect the disease, the, the, the state of a tissue, uh, um, how different tissues contribute uh, to that liquid biopsy. Um, so, when thinking about the concept of a liquid biopsy, I think many people think about uh, fluids that are derived from, from blood, like serum or plasma, right? Um, so, there's a lot of molecules and a lot of uh, interesting potential candidate biomarkers that we may investigate in the context of liquid biopsies to, to reach those goals we, we, just, uh, we just mentioned. Um, and I think most of the work uh, these days is really focusing on extracellular uh, DNA, uh, cell-free DNA, or uh, tumor-derived cell-free DNA. Um, and uh, next to that, of course, uh, there's work on extracellular RNA. Um, and I will mainly be discussing or only be discussing extracellular RNA today. Um, and so extracellular RNA, at least the way we extract extracellular RNA is using, and that's, I just want to mention that because that's important to, to understand the results and, and to frame them. Uh, when we talk about extracellular RNA, we talk about RNA that is either freely circulating whether or not uh, bound by proteins or, or, or lipids uh, or encapsulated in uh, whatever extracellular vesicle uh, you may think of. So cell-free RNA um, freely circulating or associated to extracellular vesicles. But so what we wanted to achieve with this, with this atlas was really to go beyond um, the typical fluids uh, that most of us are studying today, uh, plasma and serum derived from, from, from human blood. And um, we basically started by uh, investigating what are the types of fluids one can obtain from, from a human being. And it was actually much more than we, uh, than we anticipated and, or, or that we uh, um, imagined. 
Um, so, in the end, we actually managed to collect uh, 20 different human biofluids um, that were obtained mostly from healthy human donors. Um, we uh, obtained two uh, samples per fluid, so from two different donors. Uh, and so for some fluids, obviously, uh, um, that some were impossible to obtain from, from healthy donors, like CSF, uh, like uh, pancreatic kist fluid, for instance. These were obtained uh, from uh, patients uh, that had uh, a certain disease. Uh, we tried to focus on, on non-malignant uh, disease as much as possible. But so a lot of a lot of fluids were collected. I contributed to, to some of those uh, myself, and so did some of the lab members. Um, and the aim was to apply complementary RNA sequencing procedures to try to get a complete picture of the extracellular transcriptome. And so we gave this some thought because um, I think, as, as I'm sure you're you're aware, there's uh, there's many different RNA sequencing procedures and methodologies out there. Uh, not a single procedure can actually capture all of uh, all of the RNA molecules uh, that are produced by a cell. So uh, we tried to um, establish or to, we tried to to select uh, methods that uh, we uh, expected to give us uh, a lot of information and would yield uh, great insight in, in the extracellular transcript. So one, one choice was obvious, uh, small RNA sequencing. Uh, a lot of work has already been done with respect to uh, the presence of small RNAs in uh, human biofluids. So the choice for small RNA sequencing was obvious. Um, and uh, Small RNA sequencing would give us a view on microRNAs for sure, but also a lot of other small RNA species uh, like biRNAs, like tRNA derived fragments, um, and so on. Um, but the choice of method uh, for long RNAs is something that was uh, more difficult to settle on. And, and in the end, uh, we settled on a method uh, that we actually also uh, optimized for this purpose uh, based on mRNA capture sequencing. So, um, the mRNA capture sequencing approach is actually based on, um, let's say, a total RNA sequencing prep. Uh, you're not doing any polyase selection. Uh, you're not doing any ribosomal RNA depletion. You just prep uh, libraries from the total RNA extract from a fluid, but then use biotinylated capture probes that bind uh, all human messenger RNA exomes to enrich these in your uh, final library before it goes uh, to sequencing. Um, Poly-A based methods are, at least in our hands, uh, uh, not very successful when working with, uh, with fluids. So, so these are not an option. Uh, total RNA uh, based methods do work, like total RNA sequencing with ribodepletion, for instance, they do work, but uh, we tend to get somewhat better results with capture sequencing based uh, approaches. So we went for an mRNA capture sequencing based approach. And uh, the interesting thing here is that this will not only give you coverage on messenger RNAs, it will also give you coverage on circular RNAs. And I will be talking about circular RNAs at the, the end of, uh, of this, uh, this presentation. So a second uh, very important choice that we made uh, before uh, profiling these samples was the use of uh, synthetic spike in controls. And uh, also, this is something we gave uh, a lot of thought, and um, basically, we settled on a procedure using synthetic spikins at various levels or various uh, steps in the workflow, and also using uh, synthetic spikins that are compatible both with uh, small RNA sequencing and uh, the RNA capture sequencing uh, approach. So we actually introduce spikes at two steps in the workflow. Uh, first step is we add spikes directly to the biofluid. We typically work with 200 microliters of biofluid from which we extract RNA. Um, and we add spikes, uh, both small RNA spikes that we term RC spikes for RNA extraction control spikes, uh, and also long RNA synthetic spikes. These are actually commercially available sequence spikes. These are added to the fluid. And then after RNA extraction, we again add a separate set of synthetic spikes, um, both for small RNA and long RNA. So for small RNA, we call these LP spikes or library prep spikes. Um, and uh, for long RNA, we use the commercially available ERCC spikes. The small RNA spikes are uh, synthetic uh, microRNA-like uh, sequences. And so, um, 
if you think of it, there's there's using these spikes can reveal a, a, a lot of interesting information, both biological but also technical. Um, so if on the one hand you uh, you calculate the ratio of human RNA reads being small or long uh, compared to uh, the spike in RNA reads that were added to the fluid, you basically get a measure uh, of relative RNA concentration in that fluid. And you can use that measure to compare RNA concentration, relative RNA concentration between the different fluids. On the other hand, uh, uh, so this is really a biological uh, 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 relevant readout. On the other hand, you can also calculate that same ratio, but now using the spikes that were added to the RNA elowip, and that will give you a measure of relative RNA concentration in the elowip. And this is something that could be uh, interesting, for instance, when using different types of RNA extraction procedures, which is uh, another study that we're currently doing, is to evaluate different types of RNA extraction procedures for their efficiency in extracting extracellular RNA. So this is a type of measure that could help you compare the technical performance of an RNA extraction procedure. And uh, if you take the ratio of spikes added to the fluid uh, with spikes added to the elowit, you basically get a measure of RNA extraction efficiency. So again, this is a technical uh, uh, parameter that you can calculate, for instance, again, to compare different RNA extraction procedures or RNA extraction efficiency between different fluids. So I, I will uh, focus a little bit on this one here, because uh, this is, uh, from a biological point of view, this was relevant to look at. And so when plotting relative RNA concentration across different fluids, we, we got a, um, I would say, rather unexpected result at first sight. We were, of course, expecting differences between fluids, but we were not really expecting differences to be so large. Maybe that was a bit naive, but still. Um, and we were also not expecting uh, some of the fluids that ranked uh, on top um, when using this uh, relative RNA content metric. So what you're seeing here is this, this metric is calculated both for the small RNA sequencing and for the uh, mRNA capture sequencing. So using microRNA reads and messenger RNA reads as the endogenous human RNA in this uh, um, uh, ratio. And uh, so this is the relative RNA content in the fluids uh, ranked uh, for the different fluids. So, the y-axis, the scale of the y-axis is log 10 scale, and so you, you see that there's uh, almost four orders of magnitude difference in uh, terms of RNA content between uh, fluid with the lowest RNA content and fluid with the highest RNA content. Um, I immediately want to point, point out, uh, so PFP is platelet-free plasma, is probably the most widely used uh, together with serum, which is, uh, which is here. The most widely used uh, uh, fluids uh, for for studying extracellular RNAs, and these are by far uh, the fluids with the largest RNA content. And so, so that was uh, was interesting to observe. Uh, also, other fluids like urine or CSF that are also uh, being used and explored don't really show that high of an RNA content. It was, for instance, very surprising to see that tears. Um, contained uh, the highest uh, or had the highest microRNA content and one of the highest messenger RNA contents uh, of, of all fluids, uh, together with uh, a few others, I think colostrum and breast milk, for instance, these were more or less expected to have a lot of RNA. Seminal plasma is also a fluid that contains a lot of microRNAs, a lot of messenger RNAs. Uh, what was also interesting to see is, for instance, if, uh, so we have three different plasma samples, uh, platelet-rich plasma, platelet-poor plasma, and platelet-free plasma. So you can see a gradual increase in RNA content uh, with increasing platelet content. So suggesting indeed that there's this contribution, RNA contribution of platelets to the uh, total plasma RNA content. So um, large differences between, between, uh, between fluids with respect to microRNA and messenger RNA content and some fluids with unexpectedly high uh, RNA content, like, for instance, uh, tears and, and seminal plasma. Um, so the next thing was really to, to try to figure out uh, for each of these fluids, what are now the tissues that are contributing RNA to these fluids? Because that's the sort of information that you need if you want to assess whether a certain fluid would be relevant to study a certain disease type. So we wanted to map the tissues and the cell types that were contributing RNA to each of these fluids. 
And, and that's, not a, that's not a trivial task. So one way of doing this is using a technology called computational deconvolution um, that will basically, I'll, I'll try to briefly explain it right here. Um, this is, uh, has been extensively reviewed by a postdoc in my lab, Francisco Avila Cobos. Uh, was published in Bioinformatics 2017 for those that are interested in, in reading uh, the, the review. Um, so basically, computational deconvolution uh, is using a set of reference RNA profiles uh, consisting of genes that are highly specifically expressed in a certain tissue or cell type. These reference profiles are compared to your RNA profile of interest, in our case, for instance, an RNA profile of a biofluid, and uh, based on these reference profiles, computational deconvolution methods will actually determine the uh, fractional contribution of the tissues and cell types in your reference to your biofluid RNA profile. So you may then, for instance, uh, if this is a plasma sample, you may uh, study or determine the proportion of RNA contributed by blood cells or by liver or by heart cells or whatever. Um, but so this is uh, uh, very nice in theory, but in practice, uh, there are a number of challenges. So, so these methods are not readily applicable to biofluid uh, RNA profiles. Uh, one of the challenges that we were faced with were uh, are associated to um, the completeness of the reference matrix. So if you're applying computational deconvolution, but your reference matrix is not containing all of the cell types that are contributing RNA to your biofluid RNA profile, the outcome of your computational deconvolution result could be severely compromised and the accuracy could be uh, heavily reduced. So before applying computational deconvolution to a fluid, you need to basically know and make sure that you have all the tissues and cell types that are contributing RNA, that you have these represented in your reference matrix. And so for some fluids, that's more easy or more difficult than for others. For plasma, for instance, um, it's very difficult to, to assess up front what are the different tissues and cell types that will be contributing to plasma. It could almost be any cell type. Um, for fluids like, like pancreatic kiss fluid, for instance, it's probably more obvious that the major contributors will be cell types present in the pancreas. So, so this is definitely a challenge. Uh, and so this is a challenge that we're still working on. Um, uh, some of the benchmarking work that has been done of these methods has also been recently published by Francisco and Age Communications. Uh, uh, so uh, you can also have a look at that one uh, if you're interested. But so we took, uh, first we took a more easy, uh, straightforward approach and um, used uh, a set of um, reference genes for various tissues and cell types. So genes that are specifically expressed in, in, in certain tissues or cell types and uh, determined uh, for each of these uh, um, uh, tissues or cell types, we looked at the expression levels uh, across uh, the different fluids and then calculated some sort of an enrichment score determining um, how much more or how much more pronounced is uh, a certain tissue expression profile in a fluid compared to all of the other fluids. So it's a more, it's a more simple and straightforward approach. It does not give you proportions uh, of cell types contributing. It just tells you that in a certain uh, fluids, uh, this, this particular tissue is contributing more than in other fluids. And so in doing this, uh, we got this heat map right here and a lot of things started to pop up that really made a lot of sense. And that was really convincing to see. And I'll, I can just walk you through some of these. So, for instance, for instance, when we look at bronchial uh, uh, lavage fluids, uh, you can see that uh, lung tissue is actually the tissue that is contributing most to bronchial lavage compared to all of the other fluids. Uh, so that made a lot of sense. Um, breast milk and colostrum, for instance, were very strongly enriched in adipose uh, uh, signatures. Uh, pancreatic kiss fluid, for instance, uh, was uh, basically the only fluid that was had a very strong pancreas signal. Uh, much more than all of the other fluids. Uh, saliva, for instance, eh, had uh, signals coming from the trachea and the esophagus. Uh, also, um, let me see, there was another sputum. Eh, it's, uh, it's very similar to saliva. Also here you see trachea, esophagus uh, contribution. Um, 
prostate was mainly contributing to seminal plasma and urine and so on. So all of these things, uh, or a lot of these things, made uh, a lot of sense. So suggesting that indeed, in some of those fluids, um, RNA from tissues that were either in close contact with those fluids or surrounding those uh, uh, fluids were contributing RNA molecules. And so then you could start speculating on when you think about certain disease types of interest, you could start speculating what is now the most promising fluid I could examine. Uh, is there something else than serum or plasma that I should examine when looking, for instance, at uh, disease X or disease Y or tumor type X or tumor type Y? So, for instance, uh, for, for esophageal cancer, uh, uh, there may be RNA from esophageal cancer cells in saliva, for instance. It's not something we investigated. It's just a hypothesis. And this uh, analysis suggests that there's esophageal RNA present in saliva. Um, for those fluids where uh, it was very clear which tissues were contributing, like for instance, pancreatic kiss fluids, uh, where it was very clear that pancreas was a tissue that was contributing, we did try to proceed uh, with a computational deconvolution approach to really try to determine the fractional contribution of various pancreatic cell types to pancreatic kiss fluid. So what we did is we used the single cell RNA sequencing data from, uh, from pancreas uh, that had uh, 10 different pancreatic cell types. Based on that single cell RNA sequencing data, we defined reference genes for each of those cell types and then built a computational deconvolution algorithm using those reference genes and applied it to the RNA sequencing profile uh, of pancreatic kiss fluid. And so uh, this is just uh, an exploratory for sure, and it's not, not proving any, any biological si uh, signal whatsoever. But so in the two samples that we had, these samples were coming from, from patients with, uh, with, with different uh, diagnosis. Um, we saw very different levels of contributions uh, of, of the various cell types, levels that made sense in light of the, the diagnosis uh, of, of those patients. But of course, with two samples, there's there's not much one one can do, and and this is a type of work that uh, we would love to extend and and have many more samples included and see if we see differences in the contribution of certain pancreatic cell types that may be related to uh, to to diagnosis, and that could be very relevant uh, in the case of of pancreatic kisses. Uh, these often pose. Um, real dilemmas in in, uh, in in the clinic with respect to diagnosis. And um, based on the diagnosis, uh, whether it's uh, uh, not malignant or a tendency to become malignant or malignant, uh, various uh, um, procedures uh, are, are put in place. So it's very important to, to be able to assess a proper diagnosis. And so potentially uh, pancreatic kissed fluids uh, is something that could contribute uh, to, this, uh, to this clinical dilemma. But requires uh, more investigation. So um, the second thing I would like to um, I would like to highlight is uh, when we looked at uh, mapping percentages and mapping rates of the reads that were generated with both the mRNA capture sequencing and a small RNA sequencing approach, uh, we saw some large and huge discrepancies both between both the methods, but also between uh, between um, fluids. So for mRNA sequencing data, uh, that's the, the, the red plot on the left, you can see that the mapped reads, which are the, the red colored uh, fractions of the bars, um, it's, it's very similar between the different fluids, uh, with some exceptions here, the stool samples uh, expected to be lower there. And it's also expected that the mRNA sequencing data, as it's mRNA capture sequencing data, we're using probes designed against human messenger RNAs, so it's expected that we would have pretty high and equal mapping rates uh, to, uh, to the human genome. However, if we look at the small RNA sequencing data, um, so, so these procedures will not only detect um, uh, human uh, RNA fragments, they may also detect uh, non-human RNA fragments. And uh, so the mapping rates for some of these samples uh, with, uh, with small RNA sequencing were very low. Um, samples like stools, sputum and saliva, sweat, gastric fluid, uh, all had very low uh, mapping rates when using and when applying small RNA sequencing, way lower than uh, than the, the mRNA capture sequencing. So suggesting that uh, there may be reads there uh, of non-human origin. 
And this is something that is most uh, some, some often contra controversial in the field, I would say. Uh, there's a, a lot of potential issues related to contamination when doing RNA extraction and so on and so forth. Um, the only thing I can say here is, is in this study, uh, all of these samples underwent exactly the same uh, RNA extraction procedure performed in the same location by the same people uh, using the same equipment. Uh, we're all prepped together in one go using same library prep reagents and procedures and still so you can see huge differences in, in mapping rates. And the samples with very low mapping rates are actually samples where you would expect to find uh, non-human RNAs. So uh, we investigated this a bit further and used um, uh, pipelines like the exert pipeline. Uh, to evaluate if some of those reads would be mapping to bacterial genomes, for instance. And, and that appeared to be the case, eh? especially in those samples with very low uh, human mapping rates. Uh, we were observing very large uh, percentages of reads mapping to uh, bacterial genomes. So the stool samples, uh, the saliva, sweat, sputum, uh, are typical samples where you would expect bacterial RNA to be present. And this is also very much reflected in the small RNA sequencing data to a lesser extent, but still uh, also in the mRNA capture sequencing, of course, because of the nature of, uh, of the procedure where we capture and enrich uh, a human RNA. But still, uh, some of these probes will, will definitely cross hybridize with other RNAs. You can see that also in the stool samples, also sweat and saliva, there's a small percentage, but it's clearly there, uh, of reads mapping to um, bacterial RNAs. And so when, when digging in, uh, and we've not done that extensively, but when digging into the uh, bacterial species that were, were, were found uh, when doing this analysis, uh, also made kind of sense. Uh, we found, for instance, bacteria that are known to be present in the oral cavity were uh, heavily enriched in, in the saliva uh, sequencing data and so on. Also, uh, bacteria present on skin uh, were, were present in the sweat samples and so on. So, so that kind of made sense. Um, so another question is then, of course, uh, what about biomarker potential? Is the um, can you explore or exploit extracellular RNA in some of these uh, in some of these fluids to uh, identify biomarkers or extracellular RNAs associated to a certain disease state? Um, and this is really more of a proof of concept uh, exercise than something that was really aimed at biomarker discovery. And so we managed to collect a few very small scale cohorts um, representing various uh, disease types for different uh, biofluids, sputum, CSF, urine, saliva, and uh, process these only using the mRNA capture sequencing. So we did not do the small RNA sequencing here. Uh, looking at, at two different things. First of all, looking at uh, differences in RNA content between healthy and disease, and looking at differences in, in gene expression abundance between healthy and disease. So you can see results here for the sputum cohort, where we uh, had uh, COPD and no COPD uh, patients. Uh, this is the urine cohort, bladder cancer versus controls. This is the CSF cohort, cohort glioblastoma versus uh, a control being hydrocephalus patients in this case. Um, so what you can see, for instance, in, this, in, in the COPD cohort uh, is that COPD, the sputum uh, coming from COPD uh, uh, patients uh, typically has a significantly higher RNA content compared to no COPD or healthy controls. Uh, so this is uh, um, expected, I would say, uh, because of uh, high levels of immune cell infiltration in these, uh, in, these, uh, in these patients. So this is reflected in the RNA content in the, in the sputum. And so when doing differential expression analysis, uh, you can see that there's a lot of genes, hundreds of genes that are uh, more abundant in uh, the sputum of COPD patients compared to, to controls. Very similar image for, for bladder cancer. A lot of genes that are uh, higher abundant in urine from bladder cancer patients compared to controls. No significant differences, though, in RNA content. And for CSF, it was uh, less pronounced. There were only few genes that were differentially expressed between those cases. But so I think proving that or suggesting, not proving, but suggesting that um, these type of fluids could be applied to uh, explore uh, biomarker potential in these cases. So, as I told you, I also want to briefly touch upon circular RNAs. Uh, so, this is really a plus, uh, an, an, an add-on almost of using mRNA capture sequencing data is that you also detect circular RNAs. So, these circular RNAs are formed through a process called back splicing, and they are typically composed of one or multiple exons from the linear mRNA. So meaning that the probes that would bind this exon in the linear RNA would also bind this uh, exon in the circular RNA, pull it down and include it in the library. 
And so as circular RNAs are believed to be more stable than linear RNAs in circulation because, the, because of the fact that they're circular and so the, protected from uh, degradation by uh, exonucleases, uh, we wanted to explore uh, circular RNA levels relative to uh, linear RNA fragments in the various fluids um, to assess whether indeed you would see this enrichment of circular over linear RNA in fluids. And basically that's exactly what we saw when doing this analysis. And I don't have time to go into the technological details. I'll definitely do that um, uh, when I will be uh, talking at uh, the, uh, the workshop uh, in a few weeks. Um, but uh, so when comparing uh, or when calculating the circular RNA fraction in tissues and comparing that to the circular RNA fraction in our biofluid atlas, you can clearly see that there's a significant higher circular RNA fraction in fluids compared to tissues, which kind of suggests that indeed circular RNAs could be more stable in fluids and maybe even enriched uh, compared to uh, or are enriched uh, relative to uh, messenger RNAs in tissues in fluids versus tissues. Um, for those of you that are interested in the data, so all of the data has also been made publicly available through a, a, a web interface, it's the R2 platform, which you can freely access and browse through all of the data. You don't need to be a bioinformatician to uh, work your way around. Uh, all of it is available there. There's a lot of tools that you can use to explore the data. So uh, have a look if you're interested. And I want to finalize by... Um, focusing on um, some of the... Uh, follow-up studies that we're doing. This is unpublished work uh, with respect to exploring extracellular RNAs uh, and, and their biomarker potential uh, for, for certain diseases. And so this is uh, it's just very short few slides on a fluid that we did not include in the original study uh, called uterotubal lavage fluid. And, and the goal here was to evaluate the use of this fluid um, to, uh, for early detection of ovarian cancer. So a few words on ovarian cancer. So ovarian cancer is often referred to as a silent killer. So, uh, stage one ovarian cancer, very uh, high survival rates, 93%, uh, five year survival rate. Stage four, uh, very poor five year survival rates, uh, only, only 30%. So more than 75% of the patients that come in the clinic and that are diagnosed with ovarian cancer are actually stage four patients. So, meaning that early detection is, is really something that is uh, uh, very highly sought after for, uh, for ovarian cancer patients. So, there's a high unmet clinical need to have diagnostic biomarkers to uh, enable early detection. Um, so, most of the work uh, with respect to fluids uh, within, in ovarian cancer is really focusing on microRNAs in, in blood-derived fluids. Uh, we, we published uh, recently published a review on that. Um, but so we wanted to explore a fluid uh, that basically I, I never heard of before uh, called it's it's not a it's not a, a, a true biofluid it's actually uh, more of an uh, uh, let's call it a synthetic fluid uh, that I'm not sure that's the right term but basically this is a wash fluid uh, um, where um, saline uh, solution is uh, introduced into the uh, cavity of the of the uterus. Uh, to flush uh, the cavity, and then this solution is uh, is collected again. Uh, so this is a lavage fluid, uh, with the aim or with the hope to um, catch uh, cancerous uh, cells or extracellular uh, nucleic acids derived from from cancer cells. Um, and so we decided to explore this fluid uh, with mRNA capture sequencing data and try to see what type of RNAs can we get from that fluid. Um, and so despite the fact that this is really a huge volume, 10 ml of saline that is uh, introduced, 4 ml that is collected, um, we were actually capable of detecting quite a bit of uh, RNA molecules in that fluid. And when doing the same type of analysis to look at the tissue contribution, uh, RNA tissue contribution, in that fluid compared to all of the other fluids, what you can see is that uh, and it was uh, uh, very exciting that um, this fluid was, was strongly enriched for RNAs from fallopian tube and ovary. So again, suggesting that we're capturing uh, potentially relevant uh, RNA molecules. Uh, esophagus was actually the, the most strongly enriched uh, here. And I think this can be explained by the fact that it's like an epithelial-like signature uh, from esophagus that is reflected here. So that these are RNAs coming from epithelial cells in that cavity. 
Um, but fallopian tube markers, uh, ovary markers, were very strongly enriched in, in this fluid. So, so that was exciting. So we then went on to um, profile uh, cases and controls. So, so uh, fluids uh, extracted from patients with ovarian cancer and fluids obtained from, from uh, non-ovarian cancer uh, um, individuals. And, uh, and and started the engage in differential gene expression analysis. And so this is this is a, a very preliminary result. This is uh, 20, 20 patients versus twenty controls, roughly. Uh, so we did detect a, a lot of RNA molecules that were significantly overexpressed in or overexpressed, not the right term. I should I should say that were significantly more abundant in this uterotubal lavage fluid. Uh, of ovarian cancer samples compared to uh, healthy controls, including a lot of uh, uh, RNAs uh, associated to proliferation, like P like P67, uh, Aurora kinase, uh, MCM10, and so on. And so, when doing also PAPA enrichment analysis, it became clear that that cell cycle and proliferation gene sets were strongly enriched in uh, uh, the fluids from ovarian cancer patients versus uh, versus controls. So we're following up on that to to evaluate uh, whether there is biomarker potential there or not. But it looks uh, it looks exciting at least. Um, I want to conclude just by uh, mentioning that uh, the protocol that we used to apply mRNA capture sequencing so that we we optimized we spent quite a bit of time working on that uh, is uh, is soon to be uh, published in, in in Star Protocols also work from from Eva uh, so uh, that should appear soon and it has all of the details uh, required to to uh, to repeat or reproduce this uh, in your lab on uh, your fluids uh, fluids of interest including all of the information on the spikes and how to use them so um, as take home messages uh, I think uh, I hope I convinced you that uh, there are alternative fluids out there that may contain uh, extracellular RNA or or extracellular DNA we did not look at that um, that uh, would be that could be interesting in the context of certain disease uh, types uh, that RNA is a really cool molecule to look at um, and that with a by applying complementary RNA sequencing procedures, you can really get a, a very nice picture and a complete picture on, on the extracellular transcriptome. And I think this, this atlas could, could be the basis of, um, um, or could be used uh, to, to uh, inform uh, selection of the most suited fluid, most relevant fluid, in the context of a certain cancer type or any other uh, human disease for that matter. And so, as mentioned, uh, we are uh, ex Extending this work uh, towards more broader sample collections for certain fluid types in, uh, in various uh, cancer entities. I showed you some of that data uh, already. So, with that, I will end. I just want to thank uh, a lot of the collaborators, especially Eva, uh, who is uh, just handed in her PhD and will defend soon. Uh, also, Francisco for all of the work on the deconvolution. Uh, my colleague Yo, uh, with who I am uh, co-supervising the OCO RNA lab, uh, and a lot of the uh, uh, collaborators, also Illumina uh, and Biogazelle, two companies that have also uh, uh, done a, a great deal uh, in this uh, in these projects. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Peter. Um, I've got a few questions, as always, but. Um, Let's start and see if others have questions. There's one in the chat from uh, Genevieve Bart who asks about your long RNA seq method, whether you have a linearization step um, so that you can include circular RNA in the findings. Yeah, so there is a, a, a fragmentation you can apply uh, when uh, before engaging in the uh, library preparation procedure. Uh, that we believe uh, uh, will fragment longer RNA. Uh, um, transcripts, but also circular RNAs. We're actually playing around with uh, more dedicated procedures to um, quantify those uh, circular RNAs by um, depleting the samples from, uh, from linear RNAs, because it's still, uh, despite the fact that the method will capture those circular RNAs, it's still, still very challenging to quantify them because um, you basically only have this unique uh, backsplice junction um, position that you can use to quantify circular RNAs, meaning the number of reads that go to circular RNAs that you're absolutely sure go to circular RNAs is still very low, and it's very hard to distinguish them from, from linear RNAs. So I think if we want to really study circular RNAs as biomarkers, uh, we need to um, further improve uh, the methods that we're using now. So they are there, we see them, we can compare them 
to linear RNAs, but um, some of them, the coverage is just simply too low. We would we need to sequence a lot deeper to explore them as, as biomarkers. So would you include like an exonuclease digestion or some sort of electrophoresis or you're sort of still exploring? Yeah, we're still exploring, but I think uh, uh, exonuclease digestion is, uh, is uh, what is probably the most, um, the most suitable uh, method. That's, that's what, we're, what we're looking at right now. Um, a, 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 another question on your long RNA seq method. You said that you do not um, deplete ribo rRNA, and I wonder if you. Um, that means you've got to sequence a lot deeper, and I wonder if you found sort of the saturation point actually for both of your long and short, uh, where you you know you're finding the most um, RNA you're going to find, you know the sort of point of diminishing returns. Yeah, um, so so with, with the for the long RNA sequencing and because of the capture because of the capture probes we basically have little or no ribosomal RNA contamination. Right? So the capture probes are uh, fairly there is some cross hybridization to ribosomal RNA both mitochondrial and and uh, uh, 16S uh, and um, uh, the uh, 45S precursor. There is some some cross hybridization of the probes for sure, um, but. Ribosomal RNA is not dominating the uh, the libraries, um, definitely not because of the capture. And so with the, the probe, the capture probes are really um, designed to bind messenger RNA exons. Uh, it's the same capture probes that are applied for uh, um, for exome sequencing, for instance, DNA exome sequencing. Um, so you you get rid of most of the ribosomal RNA after the capture. So ribosomal RNA is not not interfering uh, dramatically uh, in this case. Uh, we did not, uh, we may have done this. I, I can't remember. I would need to check this with Eva, whether we did like this uh, uh, analysis to see the saturation type of analysis to see how deep do you need to sequence to, to, to reach saturation. I'm sure this will be different from fluid to fluid. And basically we have the data is there to do it. Uh, uh, all of the data is also publicly available. It could be that we've done it. I can't remember. Um, but uh, so for the small RNA, uh, for the small RNA, we do see in some fluids, especially um, the platelets containing plasma fluids, that these are dominated by certain uh, small RNA fragments, like typically Y RNAs or Y RNA fragments. In, in platelet rich plasma, for instance, I think over 85 or 90% of all of the reads that we generate with small RNA go to Y RNAs. There's a, a figure in the paper as well showing the, the distribution of the different small RNA biotypes in these uh, across the fluids. And the, the, the biotype distributions are, are very different between fluids. That's also very interesting to look at. We don't really know why that is. Of course, it will depend on which tissues are contributing for sure. Uh, but plasma, uh, depending on the platelet levels, is, is highly enriched for, uh, for yRNA. So, so there we are now actually developing yRNA blocking uh, procedures uh, to, get more, uh, to get rid of these uh, contaminating, as we typically call them, uh, small RNA fragments in, in some of the fluids. Yeah, that's a fascinating question about the different biotypes. We're we're actually developing an xRNA online course where we have people who are going to talk about yRNA and what they think it's doing. Yeah. Um, so some more questions. Uh, Nav Navneet Dogger asks, what's the relative abundance of small versus mRNA in the xRNA in your biofluid samples? Oof, uh, that is, uh, that's a good question. I don't know if we, if we looked at that, um, I'm not sure if we actually can, we may be able to do that if, so what we, what we were able to do for the, the messenger RNAs is to actually, we, we quantified the, 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 the messenger RNA concentration. So mass concentration of messenger RNA in these fluids. Because uh, we also we we knew uh, the mass of the spikes that were added, so we could use that information to to um, calculate the mass of messenger RNA. For the small RNA spikes, we did not have access to that information. We did not know the mass of the small RNA spikes, so we could not do those calculations. But if you would have the mass of the spikes, the small RNA spikes, then you could also calculate the mass of microRNA and then compare that to the mass of messenger RNA. We have a table in the paper. Uh, where the messenger RNA mass concentration is listed, uh, but only messenger RNA because we only had uh, access to spike mass for the long RNA spikes. Uh, so I cannot, see, I cannot uh, answer the question, unfortunately. This is Navneet. Uh, um, Roger just 
uh, talked about my question, but you can still compare the relative expression in your small RNA seq, right? Well, you can within in the small RNA seq, you can look at um, what what you could do, for instance. Yeah? What we see in the small RNA sequencing is that uh, some of the small RNA reads uh, map to to messenger RNAs, uh, degraded messenger RNA fragments, uh, which we also pick up with the capture probes. Um, Within that method, uh, you could compare those. That's something we haven't done. That's an interesting analysis to do. Um, comparing uh, data from the small RNA seq with data from the um, uh, long RNA seq or mRNA capture seq is probably more challenging. I think it's a very yeah. different library preparation procedure. So I don't think you can really cross compare between the two. But within the small RNA seq, that's interesting. That's something we should uh, have a look at uh, is to look at uh, microRNA, uh, relative microRNA content and relative mRNA content. We, we, we can do that because in, in a lot of the fluids, we do see reads mapping to messenger mm -hmm. RNA fragments as well. Yeah. Right, right. Yep. Thanks, very nice talk. Thank you. Um, Matt Roth asks, do you, did you do any protein characterization of the biofluids um, so that you can figure out which protein carriers are, are involved in packaging or shoveling yeah. RNA species? and um, how many samples do you need to perform deconvolution? And I'll piggyback my question on that. Um, with, what was the source of your um, sort of reference profiles for RNAs from specific tissues that you used in the deconvolution? Yeah. Okay, so for the for, first for the question of proteins, uh, we did not look at proteins. I think it would be really interesting if someone would be interested in doing that. We we don't really have that expertise. Uh, we're we're an RNA focused lab, uh, but I think it could be really interesting and to complement this and to really expand uh, this this fluid atlas towards proteins and also towards uh, circulating or cell free DNA. Uh, it could also be interesting in some cases at least. Um, so, and then the question on uh, the deconvolution, how many samples do you need? So, uh, the most important thing about computational deconvolution is, is the stability and the accuracy of your reference matrix. So, um, if your reference matrix, uh, what your reference genes, uh, the more samples it's, it's or, or the more samples you use to define your reference matrix, the more robust it will be uh, and the more accurate your deconvolution result will be. But once you have a deconvolution, uh, algorithm built uh, and, and validated, you can just apply it on a single sample. Okay? So, so you don't need a, a lot of samples to apply it to, but you do need some data to build it and, and to verify it. And, and at least in our hands, what we, the, the approach we now take is that we, we typically use single cell RNA sequencing data to really define the markers from the individual cell types, use matching bulk RNA sequencing data from the same cells to validate the computational deconvolution algorithm and then apply it to uh, the fluids or the tissue that you want to apply it to. Um, for the analysis in this, uh, so the tissue contribution analysis, uh, in this work, we used uh, markers that were derived from the human protein atlas. And um, I think also the, uh, the RNA atlas, which uh, uh, is uh, um, another, Atlas project that we worked on, uh, where we quantified uh, uh, all different types of RNAs in, in over 300 human uh, tissues and cell types. So combining this atlas, it's, uh, there's a preprint out and um, paper has just recently been accepted as well. So it will soon be published. Um, the protein atlas, human protein atlas and the RNA atlas um, uh, combined uh, gave us uh, the tissue RNA markers that were used for uh, the analysis I showed you here in this paper. So I, I just want to point out that we're going to have a, a session devoted to deconvolution methods at the workshop on its second day, um, you know, focusing not only on determining tissue of origin, but also clustering RNAs into groups based on their carriers. Um, okay. So I hope Francisco can be, participate in that discussion. Let me let me go on to uh, Sheng Zhang asks: Are there sex-related xRNA signals? Yes, interesting. But so we use that. We typically use that as a quality, a quality control. So it's very easy to uh, to look at the x and y uh, RNAs. Um, I mean uh, RNAs expressed from the x or y chromosome, not y RNAs. Um, so you can easily retrieve those. Uh, we um, we typically use those if we do. Uh, patient studies on, on fluids uh, uh, to make sure there's no sample mix-up. Uh, we look at uh, X and Y uh, uh, chromosome coverage uh, derived from the RNA-seq data. 
So it's perfectly possible to do that with the uh, the mRNA capture sequencing data. I, I'm not sure if we tried it with the smaller name, but it, it should work as well. Uh, but for mRNA, definitely it works. Um, Nicole Comfort asks, is it possible to normalize the xRNA data if you didn't use a spike in, for example, using the norm finder algorithm? That might be something to ask at the workshop because I guess you pretty much do. Yeah, so indeed, um, I think um, the normalization, so that that it's, it's almost a topic on its own. How do you normalize uh, this, this type of data? I think Without the spikes, it would be very difficult to, to compare cross fluids. Uh, I think that's clear. Um, you really need spikes to do that in a proper way. Um, for a biomarker study where you have one type of fluid, um, we are now, so we are exploring and actually comparing different normalization strategies. And uh, the, the way you normalize uh, will give you a different type of insight. So if you use the, uh, the, the, the spikes added to the fluid, for instance, for normalization, um, you will look at, at mass differences for individual RNA molecules uh, between samples, but you can also use like a more classic DSeq or HRTMM based or limavum normalization. And that will give you a very different uh, uh, view uh, on, on, um, on the problem or, or on the data, uh, because these type of normalization strategies will basically remove um, general abundance differences. Eh? If, if RNA content difference between difference between samples, a, a classic normalization strategy like you have with the classic differential gene expression uh, uh, algorithms applied for RNA-seq will remove those general abundance differences. While they may be relevant, eh? like if we look at the COPD, for instance, the COPD data in the sputum, um, there with the differential expression analysis, if you would normalize using the sequence spikes eh, that uh, are added to the sputum before RNA extraction, or you would normalize using a DSIC algorithm, the outcome would be very different. And it's clear that in those sputum samples, there is a general RNA abundance difference. And so you, you could potentially remove those differences or you, you will remove those type of differences when applying the more classic uh, normalization strategies. So uh, I don't want to, with that, I don't want to say that with classic normalization strategies, you cannot reveal relevant information. It's just a different type of information. It's information, or it will generate information on genes that are differentially expressed if you correct for overall abundance differences. So both are interesting and, and we're exploring both in the context of a lot of the biomarker studies that we're doing on liquid biopsies, various types of fluids, and you get different information. Um, Siang Zheng asks, is the mRNA in body fluids associated with EVs free or bound to proteins or lipid particles? I guess I would my sense is that you extracted total extracellular RNA and did not fractionate into like vesicle and non-vesicle fractions or, or, yes. or did you? No, so we did not fractionate. So we extracted total RNA. So it was a cell-free fluid. The fluids were centrifuged to make them really cell-free uh, immediately after collection. This was done immediately after collection. So to prevent leakage uh, or, or um, a release of vesicles, for instance. Um, and we did not do any fractionation. So we're looking uh, at the total RNA, meaning uh, extracellular RNA that is either freely circulating, bound to proteins, bound to lipids, bound, uh, uh, encapsulated in vesicles. Uh, all of these things will be represented in uh, the RNA profiles that we generated. So, Siang, to answer your question, um, you would need to do that fractionation, or if you have previous data and could do a deconvolution on a data set, you might be able to estimate um, rough proportions. But um, let's see. Uh, so, Oladel Olawayase asks, in the figure showing relative contribution of tissues to biofluids, breast tissue appears to show slight contribution to seminal plasma RNA. Is there any biological explanation for this? No. So some of the things that we observed, we don't have an explanation for. Um, we saw things that made a lot of sense. We also saw some things that at first sight, at least did not make sense. Now, um, I just want to mention that um, the number of tissues and cell types that we included in this analysis was very limited. And um, so it was like 20 or 25 or so, I don't know by heart. 
Um, and so we can, of course, not exclude the possibility that the, the markers uh, that we are using here for breast tissue are also expressed in other cell types that do make more sense in the context of that fluid. Uh, so in order to do that, we would need to include many more cell types. Uh, and this is something we can, uh, we can do based on the data that we generated with this other RNA Atlas project. Uh, so include data on many more cell types to, to try to further fine tune uh, with higher, to look at the data with higher resolution. And I think the reason why we are seeing some of those rather unexpected, initially unexpected associations is really because uh, the markers that we're using for those tissues um, may not be exclusively present in those tissues. And so we only use those 25 tissues to compare to each other and look for stuff that is specific in that tissue compared to the 24 other. We did not go beyond. Um, so you would need to go beyond um, and I'm sure if you, if we would, uh, we would, uh, some of these things would disappear and other things would pop up that would make more sense. Uh, that's my, that's my uh, interpretation of, of these more, let's say unexpected associations. So basically the, the tissue RNA reference will evolve and improve over time. Yes. Yes. Indeed. That's, that's my, uh, that's my interpretation at least. Um, so sort of an overview question you you know you you chose to do small rna seq and mrna capture sequencing um uh, two questions one is do you plan to fold in you know circulating tumor dna um it, sort of for any cancer biomarker study i think us xrna folks have to know how to work play well with them um and also have you thought of doing any um RNA sequencing methods that can deal with the extensive modification um, of various xRNAs since basically we're not seeing a lot of the signals because of the modifications. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, with respect to, to cell-free DNA, I think that would be very interesting to explore um, at least in, um, in the context of certain disease types. Uh, um, I'm not an expert in, in cell-free DNA, but of course in, in the context of, of, uh, of oncology, uh, the results that have been generated for the last couple of years uh, in that field have been really impressive. Um, so I think in the context of oncology, uh, an oncology setting, at least it would make sense to uh, explore uh, cell-free DNA in some of these fluids. Um, so it's not something we are planning to do, um, but it's, it's someone should, someone probably should. Um, and then your second question on um, the modifications. Um, so let me first say this, uh, what I did not mention is that what we're also doing now um, is um, to look at, uh, and it's not something we are doing, but it's something we're doing in collaboration with a group in Israel, a uh, group of Israel Lebanon, that we're looking at RNA editing um, in, um, in the RNA sequencing data that we get from those fluids, because uh, there's much more information in there than just uh, the, the, the abundance and, and the structure of the RNA, there's also the sequence information, of course. So we're looking at, uh, at uh, RNA editing, we're looking at variants in the RNA uh, in the context of oncology in, certain, in some of these uh, fluids, we're looking at fusion genes uh, in the context of oncology. Uh, so, so this is ongoing. With respect to modifications of the RNA, uh, so these methods will, will, will not work for that. We need to use other methods. I think it's a, a very interesting uh, uh, aspect to study. Uh, whether or not you could use um, like Oxford Nanopore technology, uh, for instance, to uh, to look at uh, at RNA uh, or modifications in extracellular RNA. So there's there's one person in the lab that is uh, is trying to explore or apply that type of technology to extracellular RNA, uh, but uh, we're it's for early days, I would say. Well, I, I think we've run out of time. There's a couple more questions um, that we've. That's our hour. Um, Dr. Mestov, really appreciate really interesting work and we look forward to talking with you more in a couple of weeks. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thanks for joining. Thanks everybody.